with this interview, I'm going to ask a series of approximately 12 questions. And if there is anything that, uh, if I've left any stone unturned, please feel free to uh, contribute. Uh, your notoriety uh, precedes you, and uh, we're very grateful to have this time together. Um, I'm specifically asking about differentiated instruction. Uh, the first thing uh, my team uh, at Harvard wanted to find out was how did differentiated instruction come about um, in general? Well, for me, um, it probably matters to know that I was a public school teacher for 21 years before I came to the university. And in what was really essentially my third teaching job, um, I was in a middle school with a student population that was really bimodal. Um, I was young and inexperienced and naive, and so I didn't know it was an unusual place. I just thought it was how classrooms were. But approximately half of my students were four or more years below grade level in reading in the seventh grade. And approximately half of my students were four or more years above reading level in the seventh grade. And there was almost nobody in the middle. And so if I went in and taught just to the really advanced students, then the students who were so far behind um, felt completely left out and ignored. And if I taught to the students who were doing stellar performances in everything, um, then the I mean, other way around. So it, it, there was no notion of just teaching to one group or the other, and teaching to the middle was the least efficient thing I could do. Mm -hmm. So what I think of now as differentiation actually began in that middle school setting. I didn't call it anything. It was just the way that you sort of had to figure out to teach in order to make sure kids really learned. And so for me, it was it was first a, kind of a baptism by fire. I had a lot of stuff to figure out. Um, what was it that kept kids together? What made them a team if they were so different academically? So when could I bring them all together to work? And, and what would sort of the core of, the, of, of that be? And then how did I get to them on their own terms in regard to knowledge or skills and that sort of thing? So I kind of began to develop a little bit of a rotation, thinking about ways that we could come together around important ideas and inquiries, but ways that we could kind of break apart in regard to particular skills or knowledge kids had or didn't have. Um, and that began to evolve into what I now think of as flexible grouping, so that students moved a lot in the classroom. You didn't have bluebirds, buzzards, and wombats, because the division was fairly stark for the kids anyhow, which is the case in many of our schools now. You had the haves and the have-nots, and if you group students just based on sort of fundamental knowledge, they always remain in those particular groups. And then I had to learn how to manage a classroom where I had to do more than one thing at a time, which ironically was not so hard because I didn't know how to manage a classroom anyway. Um, and so doing more than one thing wasn't any worse than doing just one thing, actually. Um, and that began to raise questions about how you um, bring kids together as a team, how you make a community of learners, what you need to do to help kids really have great respect for one another, even though their differences seem pretty important at the outset raises questions about materials to use and giving kids feedback and grading and common standards and different standards and mm -hmm. lots of things like that. But really for me, it evolved in a middle school classroom and I taught that way for the whole time I was in that particular setting, which was close to 20 years, was 20 years in that setting. Um, and then when I came to the university, I think two things happened. One was that when I would go out to speak with teacher groups, if I was going out to speak on how to teach a particular thing in reading or how to work with kids who were having trouble or how to work with kids who were advanced, I could almost see teachers glaze over with this sense of, I get what you're telling me to do with those kids who have learning disabilities, but you don't understand there's all the rest of that class that I have to do something with and I can't stop and do something for those seven. And so I began to find that they also developed a better sense of comfort. If I could start not by saying, here's what you do with kids who can't read, or here's what you do with kids who are really ahead of the game, but let's look at the whole class and now figure out what the varied needs are, and let's figure out how to address all of those. And then you know, we can sort of put a, 
telescope, a microscope on this group, but you got to see the big picture. And so one of the things that was the case for me um, when I came to UVA was not that I meant to talk about a thing called differentiated instruction, it's just that what had helped me make sense out of my classroom was helping teachers make sense out of theirs. And then the second thing that I discovered is that a university could stand a little differentiation too. Um, <laughs> my own students were sometimes um, much younger and much older with experience, without experience. Um, marvelous classroom practitioners, lousy writers, great writers, lousy practitioners, um, people who come from other countries struggling to speak English in exactly the same way that would be the case in a public school classroom. And so um, I found that it was just as useful to think about it at the university level as it was um, in a public school. And so the transfer really wasn't that hard. From that point, I've done writing and had the chance to work with colleagues on research regarding differentiation. Um, and so it now has a, a second layer of sort of university um, introspection, I guess, and, and inquiry about it. But at its heart, it's a, it's a classroom instructional program that had its roots in the need of a middle school classroom.